Good afternoon, and welcome to the Heritage Foundation. Thank you all for coming to today's event. Um, I'm Ryan Anderson. I'm a senior research fellow here at Heritage. And let me just take one quick moment to ask you all to please make sure your cell phones are silenced um, so that we don't interrupt today's lecture. In a recent Washington Post op-ed, uh, Robert Kagan wrote, and I quote, only with the advent of enlightenment liberalism did people begin to believe that the individual conscience, as well as the individual's body, should be inviolate and protected from the intrusions of state and church. It is widely thought, as Kagan assumes, that religious freedom is the work of the enlightenment. Only with the decline of religious faith and the end of the religious wars did liberty of conscience gain a foothold in the emerging secular states of Europe, or so the story goes. Liberty in the Things of God, the new and outstanding book by Robert Wilkin tells a different story. The origins of modern notions of liberty of conscience and religious freedom are to be found in Christian writers from the earliest centuries of Christianity, in medieval churchmen and theologians, and in Christian thinkers in the 16th and 17th century. As Wilkin constructs the history, three features of this tradition are particularly important. First, religious faith cannot be coerced. Second, Conscience is a form of spiritual knowledge that mandates action. And third, the realm of statecraft and the realm of religion are distinct and separate. And so today we're fortunate to be joined by Professor Wilkin to hear more about this book and about this overlooked tradition of freedom. Uh, let me say a word about our speaker. Robert Wilkin is the William R. Kennan Jr. Professor of History of Christianity Emeritus at the University of Virginia. He's the author of several books, uh, my two favorite uh, being his 2003 book, The Spirit of Early Christian Thought, Seeking the Face of God, and his 2013 book, The First Thousand Years, A Global History of Christianity. I first got to know Robert when I was an assistant editor at the journal First Things, back when Father Richard John Newhouse was the editor, and Robert was a frequent contributor to First Things, a frequent guest at the house. He was one of Father Newhouse's uh, longest lasting and closest friends, uh, and he currently serves as the chairman of the board of the Institute on Religion and Public Life, which is the publisher of First Things. So following today's lecture, there'll be time for audience question and answers, and then we'll have some light refreshments for lunch outside in the foyer. Please join me in welcoming Professor Robert Wilkin. Well, thank you very much. You've summarized my lecture. Maybe we can go right to the discussion. <laughs> Anyways, glad to be here. Um, as uh, he indicated, and I've spent my life in the academy, so to speak, at the Heritage Foundation is kind of a new experience because I, I don't really move in the circles that many of you move. But um, I think this is probably the first book that I've written which is quote unquote relevant. <laughs> <laughs> Not immediately <laughs> relevant. Uh, you, you have to make a few uh, steps beyond to, to get to the current situation, but uh, clearly it touches on um, on issues that are in the conversation today. He's also stolen one of my texts, uh, the passage from uh, Kagan in the Washington Post. But so that'll make me make it possible to cut the lecture a little bit. I won't have to re, -re quote it here. But I'll give you a couple of other uh, uh, examples that sort of make the point. In the Supreme Court case, um, Minersville uh, School District versus, versus uh, Gobitis in 1940, that upheld compulsory pledging of allegiance in the U.S. flag and of the U.S. flag in the schools. Justice Felix Frankfurter, writing for the majority, said centuries of strife over the erection of particular dogmas as exclusive or all comprehending faiths led to the inclusion of a guarantee for religious freedom in the Bill of Rights. Nevertheless, <clears throat> he argued that promotion of national cohesion was a sufficient reason for requiring school children to recite the pledge. But three years later, the court reversed itself in Virginia State Board of Education, Mrs. Barnett, and prohibited students from being forced to recite the Pledge of Allegiance. Justice Frankfurter's statement in the earlier case that religious freedom rose against the backdrop of religious wars became part of the historical understanding of religious freedom in U.S. jurisprudence. Um, there's another case in 47, Everett versus Board of Education, 
There, the debate centered on the use of public funds to support busing of children to parochial schools. And though the court decided to sanction the practice, again, it invoked the specter of religious wars. <clears throat> In the opinion of Justice Black, words of the First Amendment reflected in the mind of early Americans a vivid mental picture of conditions and practices which had fervently wished to stamp out, they wished them now, in, to preserve, preserve liberty for themselves and their posterity. It was, he adds, the fear and political problems caused by religious conflict that caused the phrase in the Bill of Rights that there could be no law respecting an establishment of religion. So there's a kind of a direct line between the Enlightenment and moderate jurisprudence. So as Ryan said, I have another story to tell, <clears throat> and it begins not in the religious conflicts of the 16th century, nor in the writings of Enlight Enlightenment thinkers, for example, John Locke, but among early Christian thinkers who lived and wrote in the Roman Empire. It is a tale not of political accommodation to deal with religious conflict, but of inwardness, of spiritual freedom, and obedience to God. Now, early Christian writers did not forge a doctrine of religious freedom, and for centuries their thinking was little more than a quiet murmur heard by the few. Christians seldom acted on the basis of principles set forth by their early thinkers. They acted with violence against Jews in the Rhineland in the time of the First Crusade. They executed heretics, Jan Hus, they forced the conversion of Muslims in 16th century Spain. But their writings defending the freedom and dignity of human beings were not forgotten and laid a foundation on which later generations could build. Only as the inheritance of the past was buffeted by the rough torrent of occasion, the reformations of the 16th century, did a full doctrine of religious liberty begin to take shape. Now, in antiquity, in the cities of the Roman Empire, where Christianity first makes its way, religion was an affair of the community as a whole. Through public rituals and private ceremonies, the ordinary and extraordinary events of communal life were set within a sacred and cosmic frame that bound people together in a single religious and civic community. No form of social life was wholly secular. Because religion was so much part of the fabric of life, the Romans were very suspicious of foreign cults. Most religions were willing to conform to Roman ways, participate in the public sacrifices, sort of the main ritual activity of ancient religion, but not the Christians. When they refused, one Roman governor in North Africa asked, why do you malign our sacred rites and not practice what the rest of us do? In response, a man by the name of Tertullian, some of you will know his name, he was a Latin, he's really the first Christian to write in Latin, beginning of the third century, living in North Africa. Tertullian and others, they wrote apologies, that is, defenses of Christianity. So here's a passage which, in a way, the whole book turns on from Tertullian, written to the Roman governor of Scop by the name of Scopola, who was um, initiating the persecution of Christians in Carthage. Tertullian writes this. It is only just, and the privilege inherent in human nature, that every person should be able to worship according to his own convictions. For one person's religion neither harms nor hurts another. In matters of religion, coercion has no place, for religious conviction is a voluntary act that cannot be forced. It must be held willingly. Now, Tertullian is not making a legal argument. His case is moral and theological. And basically, there are two elements to it. First. Human beings, because they are created in the image of God, and he's drawing on the Bible here, are endowed with freedom, which means the power to choose and to act. And secondly, that religion is an inner conviction, and for that reason, cannot be coerced. 
A century later, another Latin apologist, a name who is less known, Lactantius, drew on Tertullian's ideas to make a similar argument. He said, the central issue with the Romans is they will not allow us to worship God as we wish. Instead of trying to persuade us by arguments, they rely on force. Surely they know that religious worship cannot be compelled. It's a really nice phrase that kind of reverberates. Still have it in Latin, some of you, religio cogi, non potest. Religious worship cannot be compelled. Only words are effective. If one resorts to blows, there is no freedom of choice. I suppose Ryan mentioned that's one sort of foundational element. Religion cannot be coerced. But there was something else in those early years. Through the writings of the Apostle Paul, especially in his writing to 1 Corinthians, the term conscience enters the vocabulary of Christians. And the ancients had a notion of conscience. Conscience comes from the Latin words conscientia, which really means knowledge with. And it meant that knowledge that one's moral acts, what one had done, carried significance. The term was used retrospectively. But Christians began to use it prospectively, not as a judgment of past actions, though they did that, but as a pedagogue of the soul, a tutor of future deeds. So Tertullian could say, we refuse to offer sacrifice to the Roman gods because our conscience obligates us to serve the one God. Now, it was only in the Middle Ages that a full notion of conscience came into being, and Thomas Aquinas is very important there. But let me give you one example. This is a Franciscan theologian who got caught up in a dispute and was charged with heresy by some of his superiors. And his response was, I would knowingly obey no man against those things that are of the faith. But in other things, I would always obey insofar as I could, as long as purity of conscience is preserved, but never against purity of conscience. And that meant all the way, all the way up to the, to the top. You could not force a person to go against their conscience. So then two ideas conscience and religion can't be coerced. The significance of these traditional ideas, however, was discerned only during the reformations of the 16th century. And I uh, think uh, good historical scholarship now prefers to talk about reformations. There was not one reformation. The seismic shifts within Western Christendom in the 16th century created unprecedented social fracturing in communities all over Europe who had been bound together for centuries by a common faith. So the question was how were kings, princes, and city magistrates to deal with religious divisions that ran down the center, the main street of their cities? And of the many things that I uncovered as I was writing this, is one passage from a Frenchman in the 16th century, 1560, which was written just at the time when the Huguenots, the Calvinists, were beginning to be very populous in France. He said, would you have ever thought in your youth you would one day see in France such chaos that within one town there would be several religions practiced? I mean, think of that for a moment. And then you understand why it was so difficult for a notion of religious freedom to emerge, because that was something that everyone believed. Okay. Now, the Reformation first took place, or take, took root in cities. I'm going to take one city, Nuremberg in Bavaria. Nuremberg in, embraced reform early, in the, early in the 1520s, and the city council immediately took religious affairs into hand. And, pretty much forgot about the bishop. They appointed clergy to key positions in the city's churches. They instituted liturgical changes, and in other words, changed the religious life. And by the mid-1520s, the Reformation in Nuremberg was at full throttle, and Nuremberg had become, in effect, a Lutheran city. <clears throat> but the Sisters of Clare, a community of religious women with a long history in the city resisted the demands of the magistrates. And in 1524, 
the abbess of the convent, a woman named Charitas Pirkheimer, beautiful name, you can read it, it's a little book in English, began to keep a diary that gives a first-hand account of changes that were being imposed on their life. The Franciscan priests were packed off, leaving no one to hear their confessions. Celebration of the mass was prohibited, and evangelical clergy were dispatched to preach long sermons to convince the sisters to accept the reform. 111 sermons for these poor women. And what they did, they stuffed cotton in their ears. And they sent in then Lutherans, magistrates, to make sure the sisters took the cotton out of their ears so they would be able to listen. They were forbidden to ring bells for the hours of prayers. The choir was locked. They were ordered to take apart the material from their habits, dye it a different color, and then sew normal female street clothes. The aim of these orders, writes Pierre was to destroy our cloister, our cloister and our spiritual life. And in a poignant passage, she says that the convent had served God for 250 years, and now we are being forced to accept the new faith, which meant the new Reformation faith. Now, as dramatic as the tale is, even more telling is how she defends her community. Again and again, she says, the sisters are being forced to act against their consciences and are being deprived of their spiritual freedom. We hope, she writes, that the Honorable City Council will not apply pressure in matters which concern our conscience and force us to act against our wills to confess what the authorities want us to say. Now, it is deeply ironic that in defending fidelity to the old religion, Pirkeima employs language similar to what Martin Luther used at the Diet of Worms. When asked to recant his teachings, he replied, my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not recant anything. To go against conscience is neither right nor safe. God help me, amen. Now legend has it that at Worms, Luther also said, here I stand and I cannot do otherwise. And I'm sure you've heard that in uh, any course or book about Luther. But there's no evidence of this, no textual evidence. <laughs> However, one of the sisters of the community, Katharina Ebner, did say, here I stand and I will not yield to the Lutheran magistrates. And whether she was the first to use the phrase, here I stand, I do not know. But it is possible the sisters has heard of Luther's declamation at Worms and deliberately mimicked his words or not. Perhaps it was a Catholic sister who was the first to say, here I stand. The more important point, however, is that the Franciscan sisters and Martin Luther shared a common understanding of conscience handed on in medieval Christianity. Liberty of conscience was not the creation of the Reformation. It was an inheritance from the earlier centuries. And it did not mean the right of private judgment. It meant obedience to God. So those are the two points that have been mentioned. There was another, and this also happened in Nuremberg, and we have a nice text that gives us a lot of evidence of this. The Anabaptists, who were a more radical form of Reformation, because they believe Anabaptist means to re-baptize, because they believe that People who were baptized as children did not have a legitimate baptism, which, of course, was a very radical idea. 1,500 years, that was the way you were baptized. But they also claimed to return to the Christianity of the New Testament, where the church was made up of small local communities, not a community that embraced the, the city as a whole. They formed, and this was their great sin, as far as the authorities were concerned, they formed independent religious associations with their own confession of faith. They met separately for worship, and they elected their own leaders. This, the authorities could not tolerate. 
Let everyone believe and confess whatever he wishes. That's no concern to the magistrate, one writer said. But it does concern the magistrate when someone establishes a new sect of a preaching office without permission. It's very, very radical because they represent a conceptual shift in the understanding of the relation of the church to society. The church is no longer this corporate body that embraces all. It is a believer's church, a gathered church. By establishing independent sects, they undermine the historic view that religion was the vinculum societatis, that is the bond that held society together, that there could be no peace or social cohesion without a common religion. But here, too, there was another voice. A clerk in the city chancery, a man named George Freilich, challenged the right of the civil magistrates to regulate religion in the city. And he wrote what was, in effect, an electric memorandum. Whether secular government, secular there meant the magistrates who were <coughs> religious, secular government has the right to wield the sword in matters of faith. In it, he asserted that the secular government has no authority in religious matters. And what he's referring to is what's called the doctrine of the two swords. And that goes back to Pope Galatius uh, in the fifth century. It was a way by saying there are two swords or two powers in negotiating the relation between the pope, the religious authority, and the emperor. But it ultimately goes back to the words of Jesus. Render unto Caesar the things that are of Caesar, and to God the things that are of God. And in the new Protestant cities and territories, what happened was is that the magistrates or the prince or the king took over religion as well as civic affairs. The clergy had spiritual authority, but the magistrates and princes claimed not only the temporal sword, but regulation of religious affairs. Yes. So the distinction between the two swords, which first enters into the discussion in the 16th century, becomes the primary argument that writers are going to make against the various forms of established religion, whatever country it happened to be. I'm going to talk more about England. So along with no conversion in religion, coercion, and conscience as obedience to God, a third factor was the distinction of two realms, one civil, one religious. Now, a point that's related to this, just touch on very briefly, but it's actually very, very important. It is customary to think that the development of liberty of conscience was primarily about the rights of individuals to believe what they wish. But religious freedom in the 16th and 17th century was primarily about the right of religious associations, religious communities. We would call them churches, not about individuals. Several writers in the Netherlands, very important during this period, argued that liberty of conscience was insufficient if it only granted freedom for beliefs of individuals. Religion is never a private affair, or very rarely. A Dutch thinker with the beautiful name Philip Mornix de St. Aldegon. I just love that. He put it this way. No one has ever been executed or harassed simply on grounds of conscience, but always for committing some public act in words or practices. How is it possible to grant freedom of conscience without exercise of religion? If people have no ceremonies at all and do not invoke God, they have no liberty of conscience. What needs to be secured is the freedom to assemble, to preach, to catechize, and to profess openly what people believe in their inmost hearts. As far as I'm aware, and I'm not certain of this, this is the first time the phrase exercise of religion occurs. And it means very specifically what a community is going to do. All right, now that brings us now to the 17th century. <clears throat> By the de first decades of the 17th century, all the nations of Western Europe faced a similar challenge, how to deal with dissenting 
religious communities living in their midst. The most radical critics of the alliance of throne and altar were, of course, the English separatists. Not the only ones, but they were the most radical. Thomas Helwes, a name probably you've not heard, Leonard Busher, John Merton, and most famously, Roger Williams. I want to talk very briefly, though, about Helwes, not about Williams. He died in 1616. He had lived in the Netherlands, but returned to England to support his fellow Baptists. Within months of his return, he was arrested and confined to the new prison where he died. And his book, A Short Declaration of the Mystery of Iniquity, that's a phrase from 1 Thessalonians, published in 1611, offered a sharp critique of the Church of England, who, in his words, its bishops, force and compel men to submit to its conformity. And what does that mean? Wearing the surplice, making the sign of the cross, chanting an organ in the churches. It says the king's earthly power cannot rule over the souls of men. What, what's going on there is that if, if you lived in England, it was obligatory to go to the parish church. And if you didn't go, you were fined. And so people who then gathered independently, gathered, collected their own leaders, and met to worship, they were practicing against the law. And as a member of a persecuted group, Helmholtz was aware that there were others, most notably the Catholics, who were struggling to survive in a society governed by the Church of England. Now, Helwitz hated the Catholics, considered them idolaters. Nevertheless, he thought the king should not provoke evil against the Roman religion. The king has no more power over their consciences than over ours, and that is none at all. But what is most remarkable, this is now 1611, he concluded that the same principle applied to Jews and Muslims. So what I'm getting at is that the principles that were being set down, drawing on Christian tradition, now had an application that was much wider. It wasn't just to defend Christians who were being persecuted. And he said this, let them be heretics, Turks, Jews, or whatsoever. It appears not to earthly power to punish them in the least measure. Now, by the mid-17th century, texts from the early church remained part of the debate over religious freedom. And this is evident in another name you may not know very well or know at all, a man named John Owen. He was a separatist theologian. And he gained notoriety because when Charles I was executed in 1649, he was asked by Oliver Cromwell to preach the sermon at the parliament the day after. And he appended a long essay to that sermon on toleration, in which he then lays out the arguments that had been repeated by thinkers earlier on. But Owen's most original contribution was a very sophisticated understanding of conscience. Some had argued that liberty of conscience applied only to mental judgments, not to practice. So, you got to go to the parish church. You can believe whatever you want, but you've still got to go to the parish church. The royalists granted that magistrates have no power over inward thoughts, but it is within their, their authority to determine outward worship. Now, Owen was appalled. He had read deeply in Thomas Aquinas, who had argued that conscience is an application of knowledge to some special act. If it does not extend to practice, Owen wrote, the nature and being of conscience is overthrown. At which point he invokes early Christian teachers, who he says openly pleaded for a liberty of religion founded in the law of nature. And what he's thinking about is the passage from Tertullian that I quoted earlier. He conflates two phrases that occur in that text, human right and natural capacity, to mean natural right and equity, and concludes Liberty of conscience is a natural right, not based on the laws of society, but on the laws of nature. Men cannot be divested of it. So you can see that the argument just kept moving forward, and finally they come to the point that what we're talking about is not something that is granted by the government, but something that human beings have 
by nature. That leads me finally, well, I guess penultimately, to John Locke. He was roughly the same generation as Owen. In fact, Locke was Owen's Greek tutor at, um, at Oxford. And um, Locke's letter concerning toleration, which is the document that everybody turns to, was published a few years after Owen's writings on liberty of conscience. Um, from reading Locke, I don't think really he had digested what Owen was saying, because it's not part of his argument. But like Owen, Locke is working with ideas that reach deep into the Christian past. And there are two points that come through in his letter of toleration. First, the distinction of powers, the two swords. I esteem it above all things necessary to distinguish exactly the business of civil government from that of religion and to settle the just bounds that lie between the one and the other. Second point, religious faith is an inner conviction. All the life and power of true religion, he writes, consists in the inward and full persuasion of the mind. Faith is not faith without believing. <clears throat> For that reason, civil authorities cannot force people to oppose the dictates of their own consciences. The great business of religion, Locke says, lies in the heart. And he quotes Psalm 51, all that God looks for in his worship is the sacrifice of a broken and contrite heart. So Locke stands in the same intellectual tradition that formed John Owen, William Penn, who I discussed but not today, Thomas Helwes, Roger Williams, and others. But he differs from them in one notable respect. He does not quote Christian authorities. Quotes the Bible, but not Christian authorities. So the letter concerning toleration is the work of a philosopher informed by Christian thinking, not a theological treatise, which is one reason it came to be held in such high regard in the generations after his death. Now, Locke's ideas on religious freedom were transmitted to colonial America through his own writings, but also through a little-known work, an essay on toleration written in 1783 by an English separatist, a man named Philip Fourneau, not Freno, who's better known, but Forno, F-U-R-N-E-A-U-X. And he wrote, because of Locke's letter concerning toleration, religious liberty has been generally received among us, and many have embraced the same doctrine. And he highlights two themes, the nature of religion and the ends of civil government. Of the first, he said, religion is a concern between God and man's own conscience arising out of inner conviction, true religion, he said, is obedience to God. Of the second, religion is not part of the social contract. God has not given the magistrate directly or indirectly authority over the consciences of men. The free protection and exercise of religion is a right essential to our nature. Now, Madison had read, James Madison had read Furneaux's essay. In fact, he was very eager to get a hold of the book. And he wrote his friend Bradford to get him a copy and was very sympathetic to his arguments. <clears throat> and in the spring of 1784, some Anglican politicians in Virginia, led by Patrick Henry, proposed a bill to support teachers of the Christian religion by a general tax. Madison was appalled and he vigorously opposed Henry, arguing that any form of regulation of spiritual matters, and this was case giving money for others besides the Anglicans, comprise the natural rights of liberty of conscience. He agreed then to write a memorial and remonstrance, many of you will know that, and in it he asserted that religion, the religion of every man must be held to the conviction and the conscience of every man. The duty to render homage to God is precedent, both in order of time and in degree of obligation to the claims of civil society. The magistrate has no jurisdiction over religion, for religion is wholly exempt from the cognizance of civil authority. That's a nice phrase that occurs pretty regularly. 
Uh, Fourneau and Madison drew on a common fund of ideas circulating in 18th century England and colonial America. These ideas did not have their origin in the 18th century, nor in the writings of Enlightenment thinkers like John Locke. They were part of a much older inheritance. Neither Fourneau nor Madison used explicitly Christian language, yet the provenance of their language is unmistakable. It was early Christian teachers who first set forth ideas of the freedom of the human person in matters of religion. It was Christian thinkers who contended that conscience must be obedient only to God. And it was the dualism of political and spiritual authority in Christian history that led to the idea that civil government and religious belief must be kept separate. So by the 18th century, ideas on religious liberty advanced by earlier Christian thinkings had become the property, this is what Forno says, of all consonant to reason as well as agreeable to humanity. Liberty of conscience, Forno says, belongs to us as reasonable creatures. So it was now the truth of what Christians had argued on theological grounds now was seen as based on clear, good thinking. I got a brief afterward. In his notes on the state of Virginia, written in 1781, query 17, the different religions received into that state, Thomas Jefferson discussed the history and present state of, religious, of religions practiced in colonial Virginia. Anglicans were in possession of the country for a century, he wrote, and when other opinions began to creep in, the laws weighed heavily on them. And so he surveys laws on heresy, particularly one which punishes people for denying the existence of God or the doctrine of the Trinity. Such laws, says Jefferson, are indications of the religious slavery under which people have lived. They presume that the operations of the mind as well as acts of the body are subject to coercion by law. Rulers can have no authority, he said, over things that are us, ours by nature. The rights of conscience we never submitted, and we could not. For in matters of conscience, we are answerable only to God. The legitimate powers of government extend to such acts as are injurious to others. But it does me no injury, you probably know this, for my neighbor to say there are 20 gods or no god. It neither picks my pocket nor breaks my leg. Now Jefferson's personal copy of his notes is now held in the Albert and Shirley Small Special Collections Library at the University of Virginia. At the bottom of the page where Jefferson says that one person's religion does not harm another, he had written in Latin the passage from Tertullian with which I began and identified it as ad scopulum. It is only just and in a privileged inheritance in human nature that every person should be able to worship according to his own convictions. For one person's religion neither harms nor hurts another. Coercion has no place in religious devotion for it is by free choice and conviction, uh, free choice, not coercion, that we should be led to religion. Now, Unlikely that Jefferson knew the passage from Tertullian when he wrote the notes. He probably learned about it some years later, though from whom and when is not known. I must say I wrote the leading Jefferson scholars in this country and no one could be of any help, but even more so, no one was interested. Not at all. But after he learned this passage, from whom, I don't know, Baptist preacher maybe, the words became fixed in, fixed in his mind. And in July 1814, which was about two decades later than the writing of the notes, three decades really, he wrote to a friend, Louis Jardin, who had prepared a catalog of books for sale from his library. He was in, Je he was in Richmond. Jefferson was interested in several volumes, among which was one by Tertullian containing his apology and his treatise to Scopola. Jefferson purchased the book, and it is now in the special collections, Jefferson collections, of the Library of Congress, down the street here, where I read it. 
When the book was brought up from the snack, stacks, I held in my hand a small leather-bound volume published in Cambridge, England in 1686, of course in Latin. As I turned the pages and came to chapter two of Ad Scopulum, to my astonishment, I saw that Jefferson had underlined the passage and put a large X in the margin. That's the kind of thing you spend your whole life looking for. I mean, there's not much exciting that happens in the life of most scholars, but that was a pretty big day. <laughs> pretty big day. <laughs> now, there are no other markings in the text, so I assumed that he did not come across the passage just by reading Tertullian. And it's unlikely Thomas Jefferson spent winter evenings at Monticello, Monticello reading Tertullian. He knew what he was looking for, and when the book arrived, he turned to the place that interested him, marked the passage, and wrote it in his own copy of the notes. And you can go to the University of Virginia to the special collections there, and you can get the book, and you can actually see it there. It's a nice little hand at the bottom. Now, I do not think that Jefferson had, I mean, that Tertullian had any direct influence on Jefferson's views on religious freedom. That's not my point. Like Madison, Jefferson's ideas were informed by reading John Locke, Philip Freneau, and others. But he was endlessly curious and had a lively interest in religious matters. What Tertullian had written centuries ago confirmed his own views, and he wanted to read for himself what Tertullian had written. And it seems likely that what jumped off the page to him was the similarity between Tertullian's words, one person's religion neither harms nor hurts another, and his own words, written before he had this text before him, it does me no injury for my neighbor to say that there are 20 gods or no gods. Now, however one judges Jefferson's relation to Tertullian, that the author of the Virginia Statutes for Religious Freedom cared enough about an early Christian writer who wrote, coercion has no place in religion, religious devotion, to cite several sentences from him in his copy of the notes of the state of Virginia is a serendipitous great note to the history of religious freedom. Thank you very much. Chance to collect your thoughts. Any other questions? So I appreciate that, your in introduction saying that uh, you're being cute by saying your, your books are just now being uh, relevant or however you said it at the very beginning. Yeah, it's the first time I wrote anything that was any, anywhere close to being relevant. Yeah, um, but obvi obviously obviously, it's always, your other books ha have been relevant. It's just that maybe the authors of the article that you cited at the beginning are just not reading what you have written and in the history of these things. So. Uh, how, well, do we, how, do we, I mean, how do we understand that, that, uh, that the information is out there and that and this is the, uh, the popular culture understanding of these things? Well, I mean, I think it's the task of a historian. I mean, one, I've devoted my life, you know, to try to understand the Christian past and to make it available to people like yourselves and others so that they uh, have a better grasp of what Christianity has been and what its role is in the history of our civilization. Uh, um, of course, that's relevant. I mean, I... I was really kind of desperately interested, but I, I, I don't write things that respond to uh, what's going to appear in the Washington Post op-ed. I got my own friends who do that, like Ryan and First Things Magazine, and so I'm very close to Bishop John Newhouse. But I, I, I just don't step in those arenas. That's all I meant. Nothing more than that. Yes, sir. Sir, do I, do I understand you to say then that when you read Kagan's op-ed, you did not drop him a pleasant little email of some sort uh, leading him toward some of the uh, sources and references that you've shared with us today? No, I did not. I, 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 I'm not sure he even knew who, would even know who I am. and. Uh, so if you don't have a sense of that, you know, you just, people get op-ed responses all the time. Uh, my hope is, you know, the book was reviewed in the Wall Street Journal, 
uh, it was reviewed on some political, uh, real clear politics, a public discourse. Um, I would think by now he may be aware of the book. But let me then just, and I'll pass the mic to anyone else, but as a, uh, as a prolific writer of letters to the editor myself, and as one who, without, you know, short of a letter to the editor per se, just reaching out to writers, um, I often find that, you know, they don't know me from Adam, and I'm not a, an emeritus professor of anything. Um, but you'd be surprised how often, they, how often very grateful they are to be made aware of things they had no idea about and uh, how pleasant they can be, even if succinct, in getting back to you and thanking you very much, and I'll read further and so on. So uh, to the extent you have any well, energy to do so, I'd encourage you. I, mean, I, uh, I did not read it when it appeared, even though I live here in, in, in Washington and unfortunately have to read the Washington Post every morning. Um, but uh, 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 so I only learned about it a couple of weeks later. So, so the moment had passed. Uh, uh, Yes, sir. First, thank you for your scholarship. Um, I look forward to reading the book. Um, in this era in America where it seems that um, appeals to history, number one, and especially appeals to historic Christianity, number two, are looked upon more and more disfavorably than perhaps they ever have. Mm -hmm. um, how? What recommendations would you have for us to be... Um, to, to use a Christian word in a, in a political context, evangelists for religious freedom in this country, especially as a millennial myself, to a generation that is increasingly apart from this historic tradition. Uh, what recommendations as do you have for how we can make the case for it in this context? Well, I, I think one has to have confidence in, in truth. And, and if you make sound historical arguments that are based on what the ancient or later writings record, there's no other gift that you can give to society. It doesn't have to be a big uh, evangelistic effort. It just means that truth in the end will win out. I mean, I uh, said so many times, and. Uh, And in this case, uh, you know, clearly there are many issues that now are, are at the front of people's minds. And um, I would say this. One question. I, I, I ended by trying to show that actually religious freedom, as it was understood within Christian history, did not need Christianity to give it reasonable philosophical grounding. But the question is whether if the society continues in the direction it is moving now and it becomes less and less capable of understanding what Christian discourse is about, whether religious freedom can be sustained. You know, there was a book written a few years ago by Brian Leiter, um, University of Chicago philosopher, Why Tolerate Religion? And so if people do not believe in God, um, then this argument doesn't make a lot of sense. So in that sense, it's essential that the, the Christian understanding of the human being and what human freedom is about um, is, is constantly present to the society. And, and that, that would be a nice vocation for you to assume. <laughs> Yes, ma'am, over here. So just to clarify on the limits of conscience, for example, with a pagan religious group that was engaging in human sacrifice, that would be limited because it would be causing injury to others. Is just clarifying that. Yeah, well, I think that, that was one of the uh, grounds on which the, the whole peyote case was, was decided. Um, I think one has to be, in this sense, don't be sort of imperialistic in a Western Christian sense because there are other ways in which people, you know, there is a tradition within Islam. It's not been a very 
prominent one, you, you can't coerce religion. And the same thing within Judaism. So other religious traditions have ways of putting it. But the term conscience, of course, is a term that belongs to the West, not Christianity, but to the West. And so that's why it's then, I, I gave a talk, the same talk, a few weeks ago uh, at Princeton. And a young woman who was a classical scholar um, mentioned Socrates. Um, well, Socrates does not mention conscience. He stands up for what he believes, but his conscience is not part of his vocabulary at that time. So it's something that came about later. But I wouldn't want to try to impose it on others. There are other ways in which people can defend uh, the integrity of their belief and say that I should be able to hold what I hold without uh, anyone forcing me to give it up or to believe something different. Is that what you're asking? Yes, sir. First of all, thank you so much for taking the time to come here and speak and everything. You mentioned the peyote case. And in that opinion, Justice Scalia, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but the standard was a there only need to be a compelling government interest yes. for the government to for any religious rights, such as the use of peyote. In that sense, have we not reverted to the old, early, pre-Reformation view that the government has a direct oversight over the means and rights of religion in that case, if it's only simply compelling, if that's such a low bar? Well, again, I, I, I'm i not a lawyer. I don't know really the history of jurisprudence. But, but I think that one has to keep in mind that there are legitimate interests that represent the common good. And those need to be represented as well as the rights of individuals or the rights of religious communities. And that's what's fought out in these, in these debates. I mean, there are other ones that had to do with, with maybe with sacrificing chickens or something was another one. Um, but I just you know, read about these things in the paper and elsewhere. So, but I, I do think, uh, and Ryan and I were talking about this, and as I got toward the end of this book, I began to have a little bit of a guilty conscience because I'm not a Baptist. I don't believe in the strict separation of church and state in the way a Baptist would. I think that there are concerns of the common good that the religious communities need to preserve that are not distinctive to their community. And I think that's what we're really now beginning to have to ask. So um, I would favor you know, those kind of decisions there. But uh, what I discover, <laughs> Every time one of these things come up, and then I say, all right, I'm going to read what the Supreme Court wrote. I can't get through about three pages, and I don't know what the hell's going on. <laughs> I mean, it's just not my way of arguing. And so I'm glad that there are people who do that. But it's, uh, <laughs> the limits of one's vocation. <laughs> very conscious of that. Yes, ma'am. So you talked about the interactions of the state with individuals who had fully formed consciences. In your research, um, have you found anything about the prerogative of forming the conscience? So the role that the state plays in that versus um, the role that maybe the church, the family should play for that in early Christian thought? I don't know the answer to that. I, I don't see how the state can have a role in forming consciences in our normal uh, sense of the term. That's more the work of religious communities. But clearly, if you go back two or three generations, because we were living in a culture that had been much more openly Christian, what was being said and taught in the churches would be reflected in the way the government responds. But. Um, I think most religious people would be uneasy with uh, the notion of the state forming consciences. Um, but I don't know. I, I haven't really thought about that. Um, but it's a good question. Got it? Everybody, wanting, everybody wants to get back to work. 
Good. Please join me in thanking Professor Rocha.